scared now. But we welcome you to our Wednesday night worship experience. And we're going to get right to our study for the night. This month, we're looking at a new and a different perspective as it relates to prayer. So grab your Bible, grab your note-taking materials, and let us inquire of God what he has to instruct us in tonight as we get some new insight and some excitement about a prayer life of the believer. Uh, so we'll be right back at the end of the show to give you some more information and announcements. But thank you so much for tuning in. Let's give our internet audience a big welcome. All righty. Okay, we, we started Sunday talking about the, uh, a new perspective on prayer, amen? And, I, and uh, it was revealed to me today by the Spirit of God. You know, the Bible says, if you have faith as a seed, you would say. So at the beginning of the year, I said that this year we were going to gain a new and different perspective on the things that God has for us. And he has been doing that. Say amen. Uh, I've been looking at y'all faces to some of the teachings, and y'all minds have literally been blown. Say amen to that. And that's a good thing. But God doesn't want you to be so awe about what you learn that you don't do it. Say amen to that. So get past the, the stunning, stunness of it. And let's get to the use of it. When you use it, you think you stunned learning it. You wait till you see it manifest in your presence. You might not move for the rest of your life. Say amen to that. Put your hands together. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. So we start talking about prayer. And I, and I want to kind of open this up tonight because prayer, well, we started talking about faith, right? We started talking about faith. And faith is really the key component of our relationship with God. Faith is the, the, is the driving force for everything else that God has for us. No faith in God's word, no faith for prayer, no faith for anything else. So faith is the driving force. A person cannot pray to God without literally having faith. Say amen to that. So we, as we look at this subject tonight, we're going to see because God has ordained, yeah, God has not only has ordained, but preordained that he be first in our lives. Say amen to that. And so we're going to find out tonight how prayer prayer through faith helps keep God to be the stabilizing force in our life and keep him in first place in our lives. Say amen to that. So we're going to look at tonight, we're going to look at prayer. Uh, this, is the, this is part two of uh, a new perspective of prayer, but our subject for tonight is prayer is the remedy for worry. Prayer is the remedy for worry. And we're going to use a very familiar passage of scripture that you all know, and, but we're going to look at it uh, we're looking at everything this year from a new and different perspective. So I'm believing the Spirit of God is going to show us, probably through some very familiar scriptures, how these all relate to these different subjects that he's going to teach us about this year. And tonight, as we begin on prayer. So if you have your Bibles, please turn with me to Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. We all know it by heart, don't we? We all know it by heart. And, and so now, it, before we open this up, uh, I said previously that God says that he, we should have no other God before him. So he should be number one in our lives. We talked about that a while back, how we sometimes allow other things to get in place of God. And we also discussed that the way to keep God first is to orchestrate our lives according to the word of God. When we orchestrate or run our lives according to the word of God, then we are doing it the way God says that keeps God first. Right? Say me that. Now, circumstances and situations either introduced by the enemy or introduced by our not following God's word, try to intervene to take that position away from God. Say amen to that. One of the ways that happens is worry, anxiety, and different things that come upon us uh, 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 that we don't give over to God, try to handle ourselves or try to deal with on our own. Say amen to that. So when we try to deal with worry, anxiety, being upset, being angry, all those things, when we try to deal with them on our own, they take, they take literally hold of our perception or our understanding of the word of God. Say amen to that. And when that happens, God is no longer in first place. We are so busy now trying to deal with what we have to deal with or fix what we have to fix, we forget all about what God says. And the reason we do that because we never think in terms, right, of giving it to God. I wish I had a witness. What does it really feel like to let something go and let God have it? So I can keep my mind on the things of God. It is really, it is really quite difficult to believe 
that God created me and he does not want me to have anything to be concerned about but worshiping and praising him. I hear all the time people say, well, when we get to heaven, I'm going to see mama. When we get to heaven, I'm going to see dad. When you get to heaven, you're going to do but one thing. <laughs> Don't nobody do but one thing in heaven. The order of the day, night, morning, and all the time is worship. That's all they do. There's nobody, nobody do no visitation. Ain't no sick visitation. Ain't no clicks up there. They got one priority in heaven, one. Amen. And that's to worship Christ. That's the only thing they do. They, angels fly around. All, that's all they do. They've been flying around for eternity. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy. Lord, that's all they do. And you're going to go up there and meet mama. Mama up there now, wherever she is. But anyway, the idea is so, so the idea of these things that try to consume us, they try to move God's position out of our life. I'm going to, I want, with the aid of the Holy Spirit tonight, I want to be able to show you from this passage of scripture, which we know by heart, how prayer becomes a mechanism or a remedy. Say a remedy. Remember in the old days when our parents had them remedies? You know, I never forget, I, 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 in the summer when school was out, we automatically, shoes went off. We didn't wear no shoes from June 3rd to the first Monday after Labor Day. We were completely barefooted. Morning all the way to night. We ran barefooted. Anyway, one day, one, uh, one, one, uh, and back then, every, all, the, all the soft drinks were sold in bottles. There were no cans. Everything's bottled. So, so we, there was a Coke bottle broken off in our backyard, and we were playing baseball, and I ran, and I stepped inside the bottom of this Coke bottle, and it sliced the side of my foot open. Now, if that would have happened this day, man, they would have called the ambulance and, and everybody. Been, the, fire, the sirens would have been screaming. I mean, I'm bleeding and everything, right? So my mom, back then, nobody called the doctor or took you to the hospital. You had to literally be almost decapitated. But I want to show you about remedies, okay? All right, now, so my, my, the side of my foot was laid open at least about a half inch. This way, open, like this right here, right? So my mom took me, and the first thing she did was, when she, she washed it off, got it cleaned up. Then she took some turpentine and poured in it. That, that helped to get the soreness and the sting out, and, and it helped start to bleed. Once she got the bleeding stopped, she took my foot. She took my foot and, and went out in the house and grabbed a handful of spiderweb. And I'm like, Mom, what the spiderweb? She said, the spiderweb is going to help your skin heal back together. Now, I'm thinking the spiderweb going to mold to my skin, but it's really strange how this works because I watched it. She put the spiderweb inside the cut, <coughs> inside the cut. Then she took a regular copper penny and a piece of fat back bacon. <laughs> yeah. See, the copper penny and the fat back bacon, it would draw all the infection or the poison out. And you know that because the penny would turn green from the poison that would leak out. So she, take, she put the spider web in, then she took that fat back and that pen and laid it on it, and then she wrapped it in a regular white rag. Said, go on about your business. And, I, and every day I watched that thing. My foot, my foot healed perfectly back together. And as it was healing, right, what the spider web did was made it heal from the inside out. And as it healed from the inside out, it pushed the spider web so when the spider web fell out, my foot was good to go. I got the scar right now. I can show you right now. That was a remedy that they used back then. No stitches. If you stepped on a nail, they would take that thing and beat your foot with a board till it bled. Then put that same fat back in the pin on there to draw the poison out. And you'd be good to go. No tetanus shot. No tetanus shot. Remedies. If you got the mumps. They would take some mustard, sardines, and I think a raw egg, and put it in a poultice in a white thing and wrap it around your jaw. And, and you have the thing right here and tie it up over your head. By two or three days, you'll be good to go. I don't know if we believed it or they, but those are remedies. But one thing about it, when, 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 when they, when they, whatever they did, you never had a problem with that anymore. So the remedy works. So prayer is a remedy that will stop worrying if we understand how to use it. I thought you was going to clap on that, but I guess nobody did. So 
So we'll just keep on moving. <laughs> Say me that. So, so, so as we, because, because when I, when, when anything gets in the way of my worship and praise to God, it's a problem. Now, now, now when we talk about worship and praise, that's not like what we do on Sunday. Say me to that. My life as I live it on a day-to-day basis is a worshiping and a praise to God. See, I can't, I can't be shouting and screaming, come now, Lord Jesus, while I'm at work. So my living and what I do during my living, what I do during my regular day becomes a form of worship and becomes a form of praise. Say me to that. Anything that interrupts that beca- causes me a problem. Say me to that. So I was, th- that's the song the choir sings that I was not created to worry. I was not created to fret. I was just created to praise God. Say me to that. So if God wants somebody to worry, he, would, he, cr- would, he, would, he wouldn't have created us. So he didn't create us for everything. Worry are things we learn from staying here. And they become a part of our everyday living because that's the only way people down here know how to function. And we've been taught worry is fine, worry is good. Now God says, no, it's not because it gets in the way of my position with you. It gets in the way of where I want to be with you. It gets in the way of what I want to do with you. It gets in the way of what I want you or need you to do for me. You can't serve me and worry too. The Bible says you can't serve two masters. You can love one and hate the other or cling to one and forget the other. Say me into that. So worry is not a thing that God wants us to have on our plate or in our way or even in our lives. Say me into that. Now, it's, it's a known fact. You can't. It's, it's impossible to get rid of everything that worries you, but it is possible to put it in a place where it won't bother you. Say me into that. I will say something else for that, but I ain't, ain't going to do that for now, let's go, actually, let's, uh, let's start at verse number four of this text. This same text, let's start at verse number four. And then we'll read down to, uh, to it says, Paul says, as he writes this church to the church of Philippi, this is one of the churches he established on his missionary journey. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Notice how he starts that off. So the believer's life should be one filled with rejoice. Right? Say amen to that. Now, it's... it's this, this, this lesson tonight is going to be very difficult probably to swallow. Now, rejoicing does not mean you walk around all day shouting. Say amen to that. But rejoicing has the idea of having a day where nothing worries you, where nothing bothers you, nothing you have to be concerned about except for the things of God. Now, and being concerned about the things of God does not mean you, you, you slip off in some type of zone where nobody can touch you, nobody can reach you, nobody sees you. None of that. It's just a, it's a mindset. Say mindset. It's a mindset. Glory be to God. So now, uh, so he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Then he said, and again, I say rejoice. Then in verse number, uh, the next verse, he says, let your what? Let your moderation be known what? Unto all men what? It, the, the word moderation text has to do has to do on the lines of excitement or something fantastic about to take place. He says, so he says, let your moderation, let your excitement, your, your enthusiasm be known to all men. And what should you be enthusiastic about? My relationship with God. For the Lord is at hand. Say amen. At hand, is, Jesus is just as close as he is going to be close. All right. So now, so he sets this, this text up with these two verses to help us understand how worry can interrupt those first two verses, right? I can't be excited about God if I'm worried to death about everything else, right? I can't be excited about God if I'm depressed or if I'm having anxiety, if I'm having stress, if I'm having all this. I can't be excited about God. I can go through the motions, but there's no real, because the person who is really excited about God has some demonstration in their life. Does that make sense? Don't you, when you get aggravated, you don't pray. You can't pray aggravated. If you pray when you aggravated, you're going to pray aggravated. Your mind will not be focused on prayer. Your mind will be focused on aggravation and who aggravated you and what they aggravated you with and why you aggravate. Say me to that. And no matter what you do, it takes a couple, two or three days to get past it, depending on the degree of aggravation. Does that make sense? So now, so now the first thing, so if I don't want to be aggravated, right? If I don't want to be aggravated, the first thing I have to do, right? Now, the Bible says anything that we decree, 
will what? Be a what? Established for me. Why can't I establish the fact by faith that I won't be aggravated? I decree in the name of Jesus because you said, God, whatever I decree, you will establish. I don't want to be aggravated. I decree I will not be aggravated. I decree I will not let anybody aggravate me in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Ghost. Now make it happen. Many of the things we could do away with by making a decision. But that decision has to be made by, in faith. Does that make sense to anybody? I thought that was going to go over pretty big. See, because many times we don't understand. We don't understand. I hope that. I would hope that. Many times we don't understand. I don't mean to slip that. I hope. Many times we don't understand how much authority we have been given by God. We don't understand. Now, we can, we, we can, we can kind of deal with some things, but Luke 10, 19, said, Jesus said, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. What does all mean? I have given you permission to have authority over all his stuff. Say me to that. So don't let him working through somebody else cause you aggravation. Don't let him working through somebody else cause you to be despondent or depressed or whatever the case may be. Because if you do, it's going to interrupt your flow with God. Oh, I thought that was going to go pretty big too, but that didn't work either. Okay, so now, so as we get to verse number six, look at verse number six in the text. So he says, in the first two verses, everybody see the, 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 the scenario that he's creating or the, the, the uh, atmosphere he's trying to create? Then in verse number six, he says, now, in order to maintain verses four and five, you got to do something about your environment. He says, be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. Look at verse number seven. And he says, and the what? And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, comma, shall what? Through who? And then look at verse number eight. We'll come back to it. Then he says, Finally, my brother, then he gives you a list of things to think about so the other thing won't come in. I thought that was going to go over big, but apparently it didn't. God never gives you the answer for something without giving you the remedy of how to do it. See, we never look at scripture in, line in, 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 in a light like that. He says, don't be angry. He says, finally, my brother, whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So he says, forget the worry, forget the anxiety, forget all the other stuff. Don't think on that. That messes up your flow with God. Woo! Woo! That is why he wants us to run our lives according to Scripture. If we run our lives according to Scripture, we won't be lured in or dropped into the other side of worry, anxiety. Say amen to that. Amen. Glory be to God. Now, let's go back to verse number 6 and let's see if we can dig in here and, this, and let the Spirit of God kind of reveal some things to us that we may not have seen because we have memorized this text so much. We, we let our memory block revelation. Watch the text. He says, then be careful for nothing or don't be anxious. Don't be troubled. Uh, uh, in the absolute, it, it, it has to do with not allowing anything in the absolute sense, sense interfere with your thought process. Anything that will interfere with your thought process from being on God, you, don't need, you need to stay away from it. Say amen to that. I wish I had a witness. So he says, be, be careful for what? Nothing. Don't take, don't, don't be anxious. Don't worry about anything. Nothing. Right. Now, the actual, the, what the writer is trying to tell us, God wants to have access and interest in every area of our life. Now, also he's going to show us what gives God access is prayer. By prayer, we not just talk to God, but prayer, we invite God 
into the circumstances of our lives so we can make a sly handoff from us to him. Okay? And so that, does that make sense? It's like a relay. Everybody ever seen the four by four relay? Everybody hands the baton to the next guy. He only runs. So God says, you know, you don't need to run with that. Give me that baton. Let me run with it. It's going to slow you down. It's going to make you tired. You can't run fast with that. That's why he tells us, lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that was set, has been set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finish. I can't run when I'm mad. I can't run when I'm angry. I can't run when I'm fretting over bills and when I'm fretting over this and fretting over that. When I have all this anxiety, worry about if they're going to lay me off, worry about this and worry about that and all this kind of... I cannot run the race that is set before me when I have all these things interfering with my mindset. Does that make sense to anybody? That's why people commit suicide. That's why people get drunk and do drugs because they're trying to escape the pressures of life. And God says, I don't want my children to have to deal with that. Give it to me. I can handle it. You can't. You were not built to worry. You were not built to stress. You were not built to have anxiety. You're not built for that. That's why it causes us so much physical problems, so many physical problems. Yeah, especially for our sisters. Y'all will worry yourself into oblivion over something you can't control, something you need to let go, a child that's grown 30 years past, and you still head gray, teeth gray, ears gray, everything gray, and you won't give it over to somebody who can handle it. We overindulge ourselves because of worry. We overintoxicate ourselves because of worry. Don't rest properly. Don't eat properly. Do all these things to ourselves when God says, you, you, you think that I made you for that? Look what it's doing to you. You can't even eat food. You, you can't, you're going to the doctor taking medicine, and he can't find anything wrong with you. Anxiety, we've, it's been a proven fact that anxiety and stress is not good for the human body. It's not good. It, it produces a lot of things physically, but they can't find a cure for it because it starts mentally. I wish I had a witness. So, 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 Christ, so Paul says in the text, now this is a man who he wants us to understand. Paul had learned how to not let the circumstances of life concern him. He had learned, he learned how to give it all over to God. Now, now, now he, so he says, be careful for nothing, but in how many things? In everything, do what? By prayer and what? With what? Do what? He said, Paul said, so, so the text is actually giving us a clue uh, of what God wants from us. He said, but in everything, in other words, God wants to be concerned about everything. Now, he wants to be involved in everything. Now, a person may say, well, God knows everything anyway. Yes, he does. He does know everything. That's not a thing about you he doesn't know. That's not a thing that's going on with you that he doesn't know. Right? Right? And a lot of people say, well, if he already knows, why do I have to tell him? Huh? Because telling him proves you have faith that he is. And God, God, in God's economy, faith does what? Speak. Yeah. Gosh, I already know what's going on with you. I want you to tell me. Because if you tell me, that means you believe that I can do something with it. If, if you don't tell me, that means you want to handle it. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to let you handle it. I'm going to let you worry your crazy self right into oblivion. You're going to be saved and crazy. <laughs> and many people like that come to church every week and worry, upset. Life in shambles and tell me, I love the Lord. How can, how can that's kind of like the engine say, you speak with forked tongue. One side says, I love the Lord. Then you got all this word. That doesn't make sense. Does it? Not according to the scriptures. Does that make sense? Paul says, but by everything, by what? Prayer, talking to God. Now, what does that mean? That means God says, I want to know everything that's going on with you. There's not a thing about you that's going on. I don't want to know. I want to know the big stuff, the little stuff, the in-between stuff, the stuff you think you got a control of. I need to know that too. Because you're not equipped to handle anything but praise and worship. That's it for you. That's all I gave you the ability to do. And anything other than that will interrupt that process. Does that make sense? 
So Paul said, so the cure for that, so if you want prayer to be a remedy, we got to learn to commit everything to God, talking to God, not to the friend, not to the best friend or the, the, the brother or whatever the case may be, committed to God. Same in there. Everything by prayer. Supplication has to do with the things we want God to take care of or the things we need for God to do or when we pray the word of God back to him. Say amen to that. Now, I'm reminded of the scripture in the book of Acts when Peter and John, when Peter and John was arrested. Remember, they were arrested in Acts chapter 6, I believe, 9 or 6, somewhere in there. And they didn't, they, they didn't keep them, but they whipped them. They whipped them and let them go. And the Bible says they went and found some other brothers and sisters, and they prayed. God, you heard what they said. That's all they said about what they did. God, you heard what they said. Now, grant us boldness that we go back and do preaching. And laying on of hands in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And the Bible said the room shook. Now, why didn't they go back and worry about that thing? Because their mission wasn't worry. Their mission was doing what God said. Say amen to that. See, we go back and worry. Oh, uh, well, do the best you can with that. Now, so he says everything by prayer, supplication, uh, make one needs. Of, so through the scriptures, we find out how to get our needs known to God. Say amen to that. How to get our needs known to God. He says everything by prayer, supplication. And then also as we, as we give our petitions or our supplications to God, our prayer to God, it's followed up with thanksgiving. With thanks, thanksgiving is the idea. I know this is going to happen because I'm praying in faith. And we looked at Sunday. If I desire it and I believe it, I'm going to have it. Say amen to that. And I, I'm not going to get up from here this prayer where am I am praying without it done take, taking place. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, so he said, everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving, let your what? Let your request be made known. You know what the word request in the text means? It actually do, let the promise that God has made to you be known to him. So you see, no matter what you're dealing with, there's a promise that covers it. I really thought that was going to go over big. The every, for everything you're going through, there's a promise that covers. The promise is what you're going to pray and supplicate and thank God for. You can't thank it for the problem. Does that make sense to anybody? Now, I really thought that was going to go a bit. It's the promise that you pray and tell God and thank God for. You don't worry about the issue because when the promise comes, the issue fades. Now, watch this. This is what you don't see in the text. When you pray the promise, when the promise is manifested, the problem can't stay around. <coughs> well, okay. All right. So he says, let your request be made known. Speak it. Known. Speak. Because faith speaks. Say amen to that. So when you're praying, you are being heard not only by God, but by yourself. Say amen to that. So prayer is something that, so you know how people, let's have a moment of silence. Glad you did that because that's all it is, a moment of silence. God does not recognize a moment of silence. <laughs> Faith is not silent. And you can't, you can't, you can't, you, you can, it is impossible to pray in faith and not open your mouth because faith speaks. Amen. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Does that make sense to anybody? See him in there. Now, many times the reason people don't pray like that, embarrassed, shame, because it's an uncomfortable act. When we have corporate prayer on Friday night, say me to that. How, we've been doing it now for how long? A long time. Say me to that, right? A long time. Many times I can ask people to pray, they get all nervous, shaky, stammering. Why? Because it's uncomfortable. The reason it's uncomfortable, I don't practice that in my everyday life. So it makes me uncomfortable to pray out loud in front of people. It makes me uncomfortable to pray out loud when people are looking at me. I sense them looking at me, and that makes me uncomfortable. Well, see, that's another hurdle you got to overcome. So you got to come to the point, I don't care who hear me. I'm not interested in who see. I'm interested in who answer. I wish I had... A witness. Say amen to that. And that's why, that's where this thing comes from, from by your head and close your eyes. Because if you don't see nobody looking at you, you won't be embarrassed. There's no scripture that says you must close your eyes when you pray. You won't find it in the Bible. 
You won't find it. And to me, if it ain't in the Bible, I ain't doing it. That's why I don't pray with my eyes closed no more. You might try to hit me. I need to see you swinging. <laughs> I wish I had a witness. I ain't be closing my eyes and you swing on me and I don't see you. The inner right robber. <laughs> I need to see it coming, so I'm going to duck and either counter or get out the way, one of the two. Say amen to that. Y'all finally woke up. Hallelujah. All right. So he says, everything, be careful. So, so the idea, don't be anxious or have anxiety for anything. Now, in order to pull this, say pull this off. In order to pull this off, I've got to be comfortable with doing this with God. Say amen to that. Now, so that means I've got to be, so it has to become a part of my daily prayer. My activity is spending time with God, talking to God. You can do this working. And, ne- and it'll never interrupt your, your job. Never. Mm-mm. What you doing? Just praying? Really? Yeah. You finished with that project? Sure. Yeah. What you doing now? Doing the re- other project? What you doing with that? I'm praying. Yeah. It ain't interrupt nothing. See, prayer, prayer is not something you got to stop everything. Stop the presses. Don't move. Be quiet. Those are things we were taught. In other words, we, we, we give more reverence to the atmosphere of prayer than prayer. People praying. Watch this. People praying, they hold the doors. Don't let nobody in church. Hey, come here now. What? They praying. I can't come in and they praying. So you got more respect for the atmosphere than prayer itself. Does that make sense? I'm not trying to mess with anybody's theology. I'm just saying things, things that I, that I, that I purposely myself, I wanted to overcome. Because they were hindering, they were hindering me getting in a position where I wanted to be with God. And I had to move all of those things that I had been taught out of the way so I could really have a place with God that I wanted to be. And I had to work through all of that. But it messes with your head because that's what you've been taught your whole life. Say amen to that. It messes with your head. You, you got to pray. Get on your knees and pray. What, does the Bible say that? What's the use of being on your knees when you're disobeying in your heart? You got the position right, but the attitude is all jacked up. See, so 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 you can look like you in the right relationship with God by kneeling. But if your heart is dirty, you just look the position is right. But the attitude is all jacked up. But the person who looks at you, they're, oh, they really into the Lord. And God is like, they're really not. Because God looks on their heart, not the position. See. So I'm com- myself, I'm comfortable with standing and praying. I'm comfortable with sitting with praying. See, because I know God doesn't look at my position. He looks at my heart. Does that make sense to anybody? So Paul says, be careful. Be careful for what? Nothing. That's why, that's why anytime you have situations like job pressures, family pressures, get that stuff to God. Let him have it. L- release it. Give it over to him. Why? Because that's what he wants. He doesn't want you to have anything in your way stopping you from giving him praise and giving him glory and doing the things he wants you to do. You need to have a free mind to do that. I wish I had a witness. Now, y'all all right? Look at verse number seven. He says when, now, now again, uh, be kept for nothing but everything by prayer, supplication, with thanksgiving. Of course, this is done in faith, right? Right now. Now, this next verse shows us the automatic return. When we do the first verse by faith, here it is. And the what? Peace of God, which does what? Shall what? You see that? That's automatic. Watch this. Watch this. So when I pray to God and release what is aggravating me, what happens? The peace of God comes. Now watch this. You got you to you kind of get a visual of this. All right, now, Sunday, we watched the Philadelphia Eagles dethrone the New England Patriots. Everybody was happy about that. 
That was an answer to prayer. <laughs> Say amen to that. But what, but what I want to show you, what I want to show you is how, what I want to show you is how the eagles play help them beat, the, uh, how the eagles play help them beat the, the, the patriots. Now, it, the Bible says, and the peace of God which passes on the soul. So when I do verse number six in faith, verse number seven automatically takes place. You notice he doesn't say I don't have to ask for that. The peace of God comes. Right? The peace of God comes. So it's like when I execute verse number six, offense. Right? Defense comes right in behind offense to protect me so what I release offensively doesn't come back on me to get me again. Does that make sense to anybody? Now, that happens automatically because I did verse number six in faith, right? He says, and the peace of God, who's, who's the peace is? It's the peace of God, right? That what? Watch it now, now, now. The peace of God that passes all understanding. Understanding is the key, for, key word in that particular text. It has to do with the intellect of a man or woman. In other words, this peace blows your intellect's mind. Intellectually speaking, this shouldn't work. <laughs> not with what you're going through. Say amen to that. Intellectually, this shouldn't happen, not with what you're going through. But, but, but this peace boggles the mind of the intellect. So the intellect cannot intellectualize what is taking place in you because it shouldn't take place. But intellect doesn't know you exercise offensively, verse number six. You see it? Now, it shouldn't happen, and you, we're supposed to even be blown away by it ourselves. How is it I'm unfunctioning with all of this happening around me? It's happening around me because I released it from inside of me. Does that make sense to anybody? See, as long as the trouble is running around out there, that's fine. I just don't need it running inside of me because when it's inside of me, it interrupts my relationship with God. That's why I'm not anxious for anything. I don't need any of that stuff bothering me. Now watch it. The, 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 the anxieties of life, they bother our emotions and our mindset. They have, a, they have the ability to unfocus my focus. They have the ability to rob me of my understanding or perception of the word of God. They have the ability to rob me of my hearing from the Holy Spirit. Now watch this. So I, I, that's when it's in me. I, but I don't need that in me, so I have to release it. So I'm not going to be anxious for the word about it. I'm going to do what the verse says and get it out of me. I need to be on guard so I can perceive and understand and hear and know. Now watch this. And I need to be like that all the time. Mm, I thought sure that would, but I guess that didn't. Anyway, so he said in verse number six, and the peace of God, which uh, passes, the, it, the word passes in the text has to do with excellence. Say excellence. And the excellence, which is of the peace of God, which is excellent, or the excellence of God, uh, that passes uh, the intellect, that boggles the intellect, preserve it preserves us spiritually so the peace of god watch this it's like this now in 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 football the quarterback has a pocket that he retreats to after the ball is snapped to throw the football they would like coaches like for him to stay in the pocket when possible right now, when a quarterback has to scramble out of the pocket, that means his offensive line collapsed. They, it, they collapsed. They either slipped down, fell down, or got knocked down, right? They're even supposed to maintain that pocket. Now, when it's like, it's, what is it, five guys on offensive line? Five, I think, five? They're five on offensive line, and they're blocking five on the defensive line, or four, and they start blocking. There's always like one extra man. That one extra man is supposed to picks up, pick up blitz in trouble. Right? If he, if, in, in the game Sunday, the guy for the Eagles, the, the nose tackle, that's what they call the center, now nose tackle, he was blocking, 
And another guy came in and he did this and took them both down. He picked up his guy and he picked up the block to maintain the integrity of the pocket so the quarterback could throw the football. Now, now, here it is. So when I, when I offensively release all this anxiety, peace comes in and develops a pocket around me. Get it? Now, the, the pocket is not on the outside of me. The pocket is on the inside of me. What, what he wants to maintain, he wants to maintain the integrity of my thought life. And, and, and since I freed my mind of all the anxiety and worry, all that kind of stuff, peace comes in and says, okay, I'm going to block and protect your mindset, and I'm going to catch everything that's in front of me and all them blitzing troubles that try to blitz and catch from the east side, I'm going to catch all of them. Now, unlike football, every now and then they miss a blitz. The peace of God don't miss no blocks. Does that make sense to anybody? So the idea of the text, he says, and the peace of God, which does what? intellectually there's no understanding this it's a faith thing right again it's a faith thing because in it this kind of this kind of protection blows the intellect's ability to intellectualize now we pri- we as humans pride ourselves on trying to figure out everything sometimes it's mostly it's our downfall especially when it comes to god say amen to that but intellectually speaking this shouldn't take place according to the world it is impossible to release anxiety from yourself without the help of some kind of medication. You got to retreat to some kind of medication. You either going to be high all day, semi high all day, or knocked out sleep all day, or two or three of the above, right? In order to have this kind of situation, not by that's why that's why psychologists all they do is medicate people. They medicate them because they don't have any, there, there's no cure for schizophrenia. So what we do, we keep them meditate, medicated. There's no, there's no cure for post-traumatic stress disorder, at least so they say. So what we do, we give them pills. We keep them walking around like zombies all day. So what really is troubling them is in them, it's just medically suppressed. Let them get off that medication today. Give it a couple of days to clear out their system and watch what happens. This anxiety is designed to make you act unnaturally, make you do things that are unnatural, and as a result, make you do things to yourself to try to stop it from being anxiety. God said, I want you to do that. Does that make sense? So he says then, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall what? Guard. That's God. Say guard. Guard what? Now there's two words he mentioned there, guard heart and mind. Now, now, everybody put the head over the chest where you think your heart is. That ain't it. You don't think from there. You don't think from there. All that does is pump blood. Now, you do want it to pump blood, but it don't reason, it don't think, it doesn't deny that, right? This is important because the word heart in the text has to do with the, the, it has to do with the spirit where God has influence. It has to do where God has influence with you. So anxiety interrupts God's influence. Right? When you worry about anything too much, God can't even get anything to you. Can't even tell you what to do. You're so consumed with the worry. And that's it. You know how people, when people say, I have test anxieties? I say, yeah, you probably do. Why? Because you keep saying it. Yeah, you got text anxieties. How you know that? Because you've been saying it all your life. Somebody told you when you was in first grade, this child here has test anxieties. How you know that? Because they don't ever pass a test. Did it ever be because you didn't study? Or because you didn't know the material? So what we do, we label it something, and then I get you to agree with the labeling, right? And you keep saying it. I have text anxiety. Now you can't get your driver's license because you got test anxieties. Can't do this because you got test anxiety. Can't get that because you got, can't even fill out an application. I got test. Then you move from text anxiety to this. And you, just, you just heap a whole bunch of anxiousness on top of yourself. And it all started with that first grade teacher who wouldn't teach you how to take tests, but rather gave you a crutch not to take tests. Right, 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 right. Yeah, I have test anxiety. I don't know test anxiety. When I was in, in elementary school, teacher said, you got test anxiety? Let me get it out of you right now. Get that strap. I'm going to fix your anxiety right now. And actually, and watch this now. So watch, so you see, that's how it's introduced. 
Everything is introduced to us through a thought. And we, and we, and we, and we, we solidify it by speaking it over and over. And, that, you, you know, you know, you, you, the baby probably going to have text anxiety, too, you know, because you had text anxiety, too. So that means the baby going to have it, too. So don't be surprised if it be difficult for her to pass that child three months old. And, and, and then when they get old enough to hear, you know, you, you probably going to have text anxieties like your mom and dad because we had them. And that child, yeah, I'm going to have text anxiety. They hit school the first day. I can't take no tests while I got anxiety. You ain't know what ABC <laughs> They believe that. And, and, and because they've heard it so much and heard it said so much and heard it preached so much, they develop faith for it. And that, their faith tells them they can't take tests. And so anytime a test is introduced, they go through this anxiety stuff. And God says, don't do that for anything. Everything by prayer supplication. Does that make sense to anybody? Yeah. Right, now watch the text. Okay, let's see here. He says then, and the peace of God which passes all understand, that peace has to do with uh, a tranquility. Say tranquility. Uh, anybody, ever, ever went to, anybody ever went to a spa and had a date, like a massage at a spa and all of that? Yeah. Whoever went? I like to go to them, man. I know y'all don't go. I like to go to them. Especially if you go to them good ones. Like Satan Harbor Spa, they give you a good one. I highly recommend it. They, oh, man. They, you go in there, and they put these aroma scents that's working, you know, and then they have on this, this music that I don't know what it does to you, but it just send you, it just send you to a place. You know, it's, it's tranquil. And, and then, and then when, they, when, they, when they start the massaging and stuff like that, literally, you know, all the tension j- just, yeah, you'd be like a limp noodle. Cause I'm serious, man. It, you'd be so, re- I mean, no stress, no tension, no, ang- they just kind of get rid of it all in that massage thing. And I like to get the long one, the longest one. I get the long one. So they, they work on me a long time. And to be honest, when, when they're done, the lady said, okay, we're done. They can say, you can leave whenever you're ready. When I get up, it's almost hard for me to walk. I'm so relaxed and my body is so untense. That's the kind of tranquility that results when the peace comes. You know why? Because anxiety and distress and all those things puts a separation between me and God. Peace says, bring it back. Bring, not the anxiety. Bring them back. Bring them back to this tranquility, to this comfort, to this relaxing point where God is. Because peace tried to take them. I mean, anxiety tried to take them away. Glory be to God. Now, I really thought that was going to go there. It has to do with it has to do with anxiety moving me out of the favor of God, peace bringing me back in the favor of God. See, many times we never think in terms of that, and it's simple, it's really quite naturally because I don't understand. I don't know what the Word of God has to say about things like that. So, I never thought about worrying, moving me out of the presence of God. Well, it has to. I can't be in the presence of number one when I got something else in the number one, right? So God says, peace brings you back and guards your heart so that won't happen. Now, heart has to do, heart has to do with the influence, the, the, the part of you that God has influenced. Anxiety bothers that or blocks God from having influence in us. And, and mine has to do with my understanding. Now, the place that God has influence on me is my spirit, right? He, by the Holy Ghost, introduces things to my spirit. My spirit introduces those things to my mind. Where does anxiety set up its shop? In my mind. So God can't influence me because there's somebody else already influencing me. I'm going to kill that Sullivan. He done made me mad for the last time. I ain't going to quit till I kill him. That's all I think about. That's all I'm dreaming about. That's all I'm, I'm eating lunch over that thing. I'm doing that. So God, hear the spirit of God. No, you don't want to do that. Block. It's blocked. It's blocked. I don't, he ain't hearing that. Why? I, I don't have no influence. Why? Because he moved me from the throne to the outside. Well, who's on the throne now? Anxiety, anger, all that other stuff. Does that make sense? So he's going to carry out what's in his mind because I can't influence him through his spirit because anxiety got it blocked. And not only that, and since I can't influence, he has no understanding. He has no understanding. 
And that's why sometimes you wonder, why a person do that? And they've been in church all their life. Why they did that? That's the problem. They were in church. They were never in Christ. That's a different thing. Glory be to God. So he says, everybody all right? He says, he says, and the peace of God which passes all understanding will do what? It, say, say guard. Now, now, so, so now, so when I'm praying, and that's why I say when we, as we learn scripture, scripture has to be the thing that flows out of me all the time. Every time something happens, I got to approach it from a scripture perspective. Say amen to that. Uh, 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 let me give you a good example. Um, let's say, let's say, let's say, all right, uh, you retired. Remember when you were working in, in the hospital? You ever had them come and introduce a new procedure without really giving you training on it? And they would all probably say something, well, you should know how to do that because you know how to do this, 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 and this. And even though they seem a little bit different, right? So now watch it. So, so if that were to happen to a, uh, if that were to happen, which it will happen to a believer, all right, so what should that believe? Should he go through anxiety or different things like that? No. He should think in terms of, oh, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I have the Spirit of God in me. He's supposed to guide me in the all truth. So I'm going to be listening to him to tell me what to do with this new procedure, even though they ain't trained me. I do have some background in certain things that help me with this. But I need to know exactly how to do this. So instead of getting anxious or worried over it, I retreat to the word of God to find a solution to it. Right? And the Bible says that God will do that because the spirit of God is where? In you. And so he wants to make all truth known to you. Not, that's not just the truth of the word of God, but the truth about everything. He does know how to put catheters in people. And give them intravenous needles and all kind of stuff like that. He does know how to do that. Because he's God. I wish I had a witness. So, so we always want to approach things from the scripture perspective. Because the scripture tells us the authority we have over it. Right? Glory be to God. So he says, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall guard. Look at verse number 9. He, finally, he said, okay, my lesson is over. My talk is over. But I need to leave you. With the remedies. But you need to think about something. Right? I just can't leave you with an open plate. Because if I don't, you'll pick up some other stuff to think about. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to give you some things to think about that won't cause you anxiety or worry. Whoa! So then he, go, he goes through this list. Then he says, finally we my brethren. Brethren has to do with those of like origin. And basically it has to do with all brothers who are saved in the Lord, who are saved, saved by the blood of Jesus. Finally we brethren, whatsoever things are what? If you focus on truth, you can't focus on a lie. If you deal with truth, you won't deal with a lie. If you speak truth, you won't speak a lie. Say amen to that. Finally, whatsoever things are true. Whatsoever things are honest, if you're thinking about things that are honest, you won't do stuff that's crooked. Say amen to that. Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are what? Just. Whatsoever things are right, do the right thing, think about the right thing, you won't do the wrong thing. Whatsoever things are what? Pure. Stay with the pure stuff and you won't get caught up in the unpure stuff. Or stay with what's holy and you won't get caught up in what's unholy. He says, and whatsoever things are what? Lovely. That's kind of like pleasing, pleasant things. Then whatsoever things are what? Good report. The things that you can do will cause your name to have a good attachment to it. Do that. Then your name won't be in the jail record. Amen. Right? Whatsoever things are good report. Then he says, if there be any what? If there be any virtue, virtue has to do with morality. If there be any moral... In thing, that's the kind of things you want to think about. That's the kind of things you want to participate in. All types of moral activity, all types of moral action, all types of moral thinking, all types of moral speaking. What do you say? He's given us something to fill our head with, right? So that it won't get trapped and filled with the other stuff. The opposite. Does that make sense? So he says, if there be any virtue or any what? Praise. Do what? Now he goes in the text, he says, if you're going to really praise God right, your head got to be in the game. Remember, remember uh, a couple years ago, I did a, a, a teaching on mindset, and many believers don't understand it. You know, you have to have a different thought pattern when you become a believer. 
When you become a believer, you have to change the way you think. And the only way that's going to happen, you must approach it from the Word of God perspective. Say amen to that. That is why many believers struggle in their relationship with God. They're trying to serve God, but with a worldly mindset. And it doesn't work. It causes confusion. It's supposed to cause confusion. You see? So he said, if there be any virtue, if there be any morality, if there be any praise, if you're going to pray, do what? Think or meditate on these things. Now, now the idea is, okay, so prayer not only is a remedy for anxiety, it keeps my mind in a state of readiness to praise. So I can always praise God with the right mindset. You ever come to church on Sunday morning, can't even get in the church worship because your head jacked up? That's what happened to a lot of people. The struggles of the week. The struggles of the week. Pressures of the week. The anxiety that goes with the things that happen in the week. Because we don't know how to effectively deal with them. We just carry them. Monday to Tuesday, Tuesday to Wednesday, Wednesday to Thursday, Thursday to Friday, uh, then Saturday. And we come to church Sunday morning, and by the time service over, we just come around to getting rid of them. Now, Monday, right around the corner. Because we do not scripturally know how to phase them out or phase them away from us so we can stay in a state of readiness to worship and praise God. See, we, we have always been taught that worship to God only happens twice a week. Yeah, we never think, we never, we never taught in terms of worshiping God as being a 24-hour experience. Because we, uh, we, 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 uh, what's, is it conduce? Is that the right way? Conduce? Conduce where you want to, like, uh, limit something? Like you want to limit something or condense, yeah. We've condensed worship to 48 hours. Sunday, Wednesday. Then what we do the other five days, we just handle it. But then he can't really be our father when we just check in on Sunday and Wednesday. And the other five days, we just doing our own thing. He wants to be the seven-day-a-week God. Right? And if he can't be the seven-day-a-week God, then he's no God to us. Does that make sense to anybody? Now, so the idea is, so prayer, now, now watch this. So prayer is a remedy. It's a remedy for any type of anxiety, any type of circumstance, situation that tries to rob your focus from God. You don't want to allow anything or anybody doing anything to rob your focus from God. Say amen to that. I don't know about anybody else, but I can't, I can't have that. I, I can't have that. You know, I can't have that. I mean, you know, you know I, I, can't, I can't have that because if I'm, if I'm not focused with God or on God, I don't know what I'm gonna do with the, with every, everything else. All the pieces of all the pieces of our lives are too much for us. So God says, "You focus on this. Let me have rest. I don't want you to even be stressed." Now that's that's a new concept, right? That's a new concept that somebody would love me so much they don't even want me to worry. No. What's this? Uh, 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 there's a song I like that comes on um, uh, uh, Pandora, and it's by, uh, it's, it's a guy, his name is Anthony, and it's called, huh? Anthony, and it's called, You Were Not Created to Worry, You Were Not Created, yeah, You Were Not Created to Fear. He says, but you were created to worship daily. Then he says, so I'm going to leave it all right here. Then there's another part he says, my hands are raised because I surrender. Then he says, your will is what's best for me. Yes. Then he says, I worship you, Lord God, Jehovah. Then he says, I bow before the prince of peace. You can't do that with a jacked up mindset. Can't do it. Because everything about living in this earth wants to distract me from worshiping God. But now I understand prayer becomes the remedy to step me, help me stay focused. Now watch this. Watch this. Now, how I do my job, worship. The professionalism which I do it, worship. The completeness of how I perform it, worship. Yeah. I ain't saying one note. I'm just working. 
And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, comes in and maintains the integrity of your pocket of life. So you can stand and do what God has says without interference from any of those outside activities causing you to have to run or get away or whatever the case may be. You can stand right there because you're standing with the presence of God. And, that, and as, I, as, I, as I close the night, I'm reminded just by the Holy Spirit, when God told Moses to go back to Egypt, that's just what he did for him. He sent him back in a pocket. I got you. And the only thing he said was, surely, I'll be with you. You in the pocket. You don't have to worry about Pharaoh. You don't have to worry about anything. As long as you stay in the pocket, nothing Pharaoh can do. You just tell him what I said and keep it moving. Amen? Put your hands together. Give the Lord a mighty hand clap. <laughs> Hallelujah. Prayer is the remedy for worry. To our internet audience, thank you so much for tuning in tonight. In the society we live in today, with so much talk about mental illness and stress, and anxiety, even among young people, children, nobody knows how to effectively deal with any type of situation. It's because we don't know how to effectively pray. It is our hope that this teaching has helped you understand the importance of prayer and that you begin to develop your own personal prayer life with God. Many people probably say, well, Pastor, how often should I pray? I'm not going to get into that with you. I'm not going to tell you how often. I'm not going to tell you when. I'm not going to tell you you need to get up 4 o'clock in the morning and do it because you may not be a person that likes to do that. All I know is the Bible says God never sleeps, which means he's open for prayer anytime you pray. So you can come to him anytime, any place, anywhere, and petition God for a promise that he has given you in his word. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a great week. And remember Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Check out our website for where we're going to be and things we're going to be doing at wolfellowship.org. God bless you. Have a great evening. Let's give them uh, internet audience a big